appreciate that good singing. Thank the Lord for it. It's good to see uh, some brethren I haven't seen in a while. Appreciate you all coming tonight. Pray God will bless you. Uh, had a really, I've had a, a lot of good fellowship uh, this week, and I, I thank the Lord for that. A lot of good food, too. Uh, <laughs> I can uh, I can tell for some reason my pants aren't fitting as good as they did before I came. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is, but my wife she'll fix it. <laughs> Let's go to our God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father. We come in the name of the Lord Jesus knowing that without Him we would have no access to the throne of grace. Yes. And how thankful we are tonight that our Lord fulfilled every single thing that needed to be done in order to redeem our unworthy souls. Lord, thank you for your grace, for your love. And all tonight I ask that you would open to us the word of God. Yes, Lord. That your spirit would move upon our hearts, in our minds, on our wills. And that, Lord, we would be completely surrendered to your truth. Lord, I pray that tonight may be the very night that some poor sinner dwelling in darkness would be awakened yes, Lord. and brought out of that darkness into your marvelous light and that you might reveal the glorious work of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection for them personally. And Lord, I pray for your people that you might encourage them and strengthen them. I pray for each church represented here that you would bless our churches with souls being saved and with God's people rejoicing in the things of the Lord. Lord, we need you tonight. Yes, Lord. We know that without you, we are nothing, and we can accomplish nothing. And so I pray that you would work in us both the will and to do of your good pleasure, and that we might honor you, Lord, with our worship and our praise. We love you, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would please turn in your Bibles tonight to Mark chapter 12. And verse 28. Mark 12 and verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there
there is none other but He. And to love Him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love His neighbor as Himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Amen. And when Jesus saw that he answered him discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Amen. I want to preach a message tonight entitled, Discovering the Depths of the Great Commandments. The Lord Jesus Christ is found answering the questions of the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, who had united in an effort to catch Him off guard. They wanted the Lord to say something that would dishonor the Father or the law of God so that they could accuse Him. Right. And diminish his growing influence. They didn't recognize him as God manifest in the flesh. And I believe as such, our Lord had no sin. Amen. Neither was God found in his mouth. You're right. He was the spotless Lamb of God. Amen. They were religious folks who were threatened by the Lord Jesus speaking truth and exposing their hypocrisies and their heresies. He was bold. Mm -hmm. and you know what? The Spirit of God would later inspire Paul the Apostle to write to Titus. And I believe that this has always been the work of true Baptists to preach the truth and to expose error. Amen. It says in Titus 1 and verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, right. whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses teaching things <laughs> Which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of the scribes asked the Lord what I consider to be one of the most profound questions that a mere mortal man can ask the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that this scribe had been captivated by the power of Christ's answers and he admired the, the, the beautiful way in which Jesus reacted to those with devious and wicked intentions. He, this man actually asked a great question. What's the first and greatest commandment? Amen. Well, Jesus reacted to the other questions. Those devious and those with wicked intentions. And by the time that he was done. Shutting the mouths of the gainsayers. It says there in verse 34. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Now. First of all. We want to establish. That the two commandments issued here. Are great. Because of who they originate with. Mm -hmm. God. The scribes in the Jewish religion had come to the conclusion and determined that the Jews were obligated to obey 613 precepts in the law. They had broken them down. 365 were basically thou shalt not, and 248 were thou shalt. And as I thought about that, I thought, this is always the way it is with religious folks. You're right. Men always try to confuse God's truth and make it complex where in reality it is very simple and direct and to the point. Amen. Well, Jesus without hesitation. And by the way, 
he is quoting and he regarded Old Testament Scripture as inspired Amen. of God. Amen. And he quotes for them Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 and 5, which the scribes and the Pharisees knew well. They would recite it twice a day by memory. It was to be written on their phylacteries and attached to their outer garments. They knew those verses. And in essence, Jesus is rebuking all these fellows by saying, you ought to know what the meaning of those verses really are. The great commandment to love God originated with Jehovah, Amen. the almighty creator who is holy and just and righteous in all his ways. Amen. He is the sovereign lawgiver Amen. in our universe. He is worthy of our love, our respect, our obedience. He had commanded them to hear and to recognize the authority of the triune God. Hear, O Israel. Listen, take heed, believe, embrace this truth. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, a very similar passage, it, it, it connects God as creator with God as the lawgiver. In, in verse 12 it says, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also, with all that therein is. See, God as the Creator is worthy of our obedience. Amen. He is the sovereign monarch. Amen. He is the only ruler. He is called the Most High. That means that there is no higher authority than God. Amen. And when He says to hear and to love and to do, we have a responsibility Amen. to love Him. With all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. Now let's consider for a moment the duties and demands of the great commands. You know, the, the answer that Jesus Christ gave is so profound. The Jewish religionists argued often about all of what they considered to be the complexities and the perplexities of the law. Mm -hmm. And he basically sums up all the duties, all the demands in one simple word. Love. Isn't that amazing? Amen. How the Lord can distill things so precisely. Love God. Love your name. And really, in essence, what he's doing is he is showing us the fullness of the moral law. Mm -hmm. You know, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Amen. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. People often get, they get confused. Well, how can I love my neighbor as myself? Well, you don't want to do any evil to yourself. Don't do any evil to your neighbor. Amen. Don't lust after his wife. Don't steal his possessions or his property. Don't lie against him. Don't covet what he has. Well, Jesus 
then begins to get to the real heart of the matter. Because he says, love the Lord with all your heart. Amen. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Absolute, complete, undivided affection and desire for God from your innermost being. From the seed of your affections and desires. You are to be entirely devoted and in love with God, His person, His word, His ways, His will. Amen. And there is no room for anything else. You're not to love idols or possessions or money or power or popularity or the praise of men. You are required by law to love God with all your heart. And then he says, love the Lord your God with all your soul. The real you. Right. Mm -hmm. Really, it's that part of you that is immortal. That will live on throughout eternity. Love God with all your life. Be entirely devoted in every aspect of your life to God alone. Amen. This is what the law requires. Then he said, love the Lord your God with all your mind. Your love must be intelligent, informed, accurate, scripturally sound, undivided, without any distraction whatsoever, completely and entirely focused on the glories of the Godhead and what pleases Him. That's what your mind is to be occupied with. Amen. You're right. That's what you are to think about. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It will Amen. determine. Your mind will determine your course of life. Amen. Then he said, love the Lord your God. With all your strength. With all your vital force. Stamina. And activity. Holding nothing back. In activity for God. Being consumed with zeal for the glory of His name. Love Him with all your strength. Be spent every day. For the glory of God. Okay. Oh, man. Spurgeon said. I'm not to keep back a single hour. Or a single farthing of my wealth. Or a single talent that I have. Or a single atom of strength. Bodily or mental. From the worship of God. Amen. You don't hear this preached much anymore. And then when you've devoted yourself entirely in love for God, then you are called upon to love your neighbor as yourself. Complete, unselfish, generous, kind, compassionate love for others. Even putting others above yourself. And here is something that has to be understood. When he gave these great commandments, these two commandments, to love God with everything in you, with every fiber of your being, with all of your mind, with all your strength, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your life, and then to love your neighbor as yourself, they are, these commandments are to be observed without any lapse or failure. Amen. 
every moment of every day, for every year of your life. No lack, but absolute conformity to the two great commandments. That's what God expects and requires and demands. He is a God of holiness Amen. and righteousness. You see, and someone may say, well, brother, that's way, you're way over the top. Listen, God is worthy of such love and devotion and obedience. He's worthy of it. You know what these two commandments reveal? What Jesus was doing? Man's depravity is revealed mm -hmm. by these two great commandments. Because if you understand the depth and the breadth of Christ's answer, you understand that Jesus was exposing the depravity and the wickedness of man. God is worthy of our highest and most ardent love and affection. But we are so wicked and so ungodly and so selfish that we're in love with sin. You're right. And selfishness and the deceits of Satan, the most wicked individual in all the world. Amen. We've been taken captive by him at his own will. Amen. In the natural state. In fact, Jesus said, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Amen. You're right. It's not just that we don't obey these two commands. We despise them. Amen. In our natural state. With such a fervent hatred that it is called enmity. It's a hostility. It's a hatred for God. I'll never forget one time I was out visiting, knocking on doors. And I ran across a guy that I started talking to him and I started telling my testimony and I told him, I said, I'm a sinner that's saved by grace. I've been changed by the power of God. And he looked at me and he said, no, you're not. Now, we just met. You don't even know who I He said, you're either a sinner or you're saved. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've been saved for 20 years and I haven't sinned. Amen. <laughs> Well, I've got an honor streak in me. Lord, forgive me. But I said, is that right? I said, you know, it's funny. When I came up and started knocking on your door, it was a summer day. The screen door was open. I could have swore that I heard you watching a red baseball game. Is that, is that what you do? <laughs> he said, well, yeah, what's that got to do with it? I said, well, I'm just, I'm just going to ask you. Were you obeying the first and greatest commandment while you were watching that ball game? Did you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And man, I could see his face getting red. <laughs> and he said, well, I was just enjoying it. I said, well, even so, answer my question. Was all of your attention on God. Because that's what the first and greatest commandment requires. And he was getting mad. And I said, you know what I think's happened? I think you've sinned. <laughs> <laughs> the guy I was with, he's getting worried. <laughs> and I, I said, and his, he started getting mad. And he said, I don't want to hear anymore. Get off my porch. And I said, okay. I said, but there's another sin. <laughs> I said, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. And here I am on a summer day. You never offered me a glass of water in Jesus' name. 
And boy, by that time, he was getting really mad. I think he might have laid hands. He was getting ready to maybe lay hands on me. He was really <laughs> sin. And the brother I was with said, Brother, let's go. <laughs> but it illustrates to me how self-righteous religious people really are. Amen. They don't understand what God really requires. So let's start considering now how our depravity is revealed by these, these two commandments. Love the Lord with all your heart. You realize the condition of man's heart is what brought about the destruction of the antediluvians. In a worldwide flood. I mean, God opened up the waters of the deep, opened up the, the floodgates of heaven, and He brought a flood on the entire Amen. earth, covered the whole earth, and only eight souls were saved. Amen. Why did He do it? You know where the very first mention of a man's heart is found in the Bible? Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You see, man's heart is corrupted by sin. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. What man can know? Jesus described the heart back there in Mark chapter 7. He said, For from within, out of the heart of man, verse 21, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within mm -hmm. and defile the heart. By nature, you don't have a good heart. It's estranged from God. It's corrupted by sin. And then the soul of man. You see, the soul of every lost man is set upon loving the world, the flesh, and the will of the devil. Amen. That's why Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Right. And in that parable of Luke chapter 12, he rebuked the man that figured he had everything. And notice how Jesus phrases this. In Luke 12 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Amen. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul. Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. But not for eternity. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool. Mm -hmm. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself. And is not rich toward God. Man's soul is upon the things of this world. They might want to perish. Rather than on the eternal God. Who is holy. What about man's mind? Is it filled with thoughts of 
the glory of God? Is it filled with scripture verse? Is it filled with how he can obey God every... No, he doesn't think about that. You think about how distracted people's minds are today. They don't even think about eternity. You're right. They don't even consider what's going to happen when they die. When their soul is required, they don't even think that today could be their last day. You're right. That their heart may stop beating and they take their last earthly breath and the very next moment they're going to be in hell. He that pardoneth his neck. And who won't receive reproof shall suddenly be destroyed. Right. And that without remedy. Yeah. You see, man's mind is twisted. To be spiritually minded is life. Mm -hmm. But to be carnally minded is death. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Amen. What a sin it is that God has given us so much truth. And we reject it. Out of hand. We rebel against it. You're right. We say, I will not have this man to reign over me. I will not obey his laws. That's how perverted and corrupt and darkened the mind of man is. Man thinks he knows better than God. Right. Yeah. Ephesians 4.18, having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And then what about strength? There was a time in the United States when a local church would call for me. And people would exert energy to come to the house of God. Right. To hear the word of God. Lost folks. Saved folks. Because they understood they had a certain amount of respect for God and his word to a degree. You know what's saying? A lot of people who profess to be Christians don't exert any strength whatsoever. Right. They only want to serve God if everything lines up just right and it's convenient for them. Mm -hmm. Any the smallest distraction or something that would cause them discomfort. They will exert no effort, no strength whatsoever. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, very familiar passage, in verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. None. And then he goes on and elaborates. There is none that understand. There is none that seeketh after God. Amen. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none good, no, not one. You know, Christ came to save people without strength. Romans 5 and verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died 
for the young God. Amen. Now I hope tonight that even as a believer that the Lord is convicting you. You see, just because you're saved doesn't mean you shouldn't love God's law. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't love Him with all your heart. Amen. It's not written just the lost people. That's where it does. Yeah. But you know what the great commandments demonstrate? Our need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he says that in when they, when he verse 33, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all. Whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You know what? The Lord Jesus Christ is the only person in all of history who has ever fully complied with the breath of and Amen. The death of the two greatest commandments. Amen. He's the only one qualified to save you. Amen. Amen. He loved God supremely. And he gave his life for his neighbor, his brethren. Mm -hmm. For all that the Father gave him, he Amen. gave his life. He took the office of the Son of God to become a man and obey and love his Father every moment of every day. He's the only person in all of history who can say, I always do those things which please him. He was obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. In Hebrews chapter 10. It says. Lo it is written in the volume of the book. It is written to me. A body hast thou prepared. You know what that body was prepared for? To obey the father. And then bear the sins of his Amen. Amen. He fulfilled all the law. He had no sin. He had no guilt. He was worthy of no condemnation. Yet he was declared guilty. By the authorities. Even though he had no sin. Even Pilate recognized him. Right. I find no fault in this man. Yet political pressure. Caused him to capitulate. To the demands of the masses. You know, Jesus Christ offered His body. Mm -hmm. That perfect, holy, righteous body. He was willing to take the sins of all His elect. Not sins as a whole, but sins in particular. Amen. Your blasphemies. Your wicked thoughts. Your wicked deeds. Individually. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. The body that had been prepared. That holy thing. Born of a virgin. Amen. Live a completely sinless life. No one else has done that. Do you see the magnificent, glorious, wonderful love that our Savior had for sinners who were unworthy? Amen. Loved his enemies. Right. He loved us so much he was willing to take our sins, our punishment, our guilt, our condemnation. No one has ever or will ever love you. If you're one of God's elect and you're saved by his grace, no one will ever love you like Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Because he's the only one qualified to pay your sin debt in That's full. Right. Blot out all the handwriting of the ordinances. All of the condemnation of the law. 
He purged. He put it all away with our sins. And He rose again from the dead to justify us by His blood. No one ever loved sinners like Jesus. In His life, in His death, in His resurrection, in His intercession, in His provision of righteousness. Amen. Do you realize that His sacrifice of love and righteousness was that, that scribe? He understood a spiritual truth that was hidden from so many. In essence, he had come to understand what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Here's the one that will be the final and perfect sacrifice. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. All of those burnt offerings, all of those sacrifices, all of the blood on Jewish altars could not put away Take away even one sin. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Jesus Christ, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Amen. Amen. Worth more than all that. Mm -hmm. Culminating in a perfect righteousness that he obtained and freely gave. To his people. Yeah. Here's what's so amazing to me. What we could never supply. Jesus Christ freely gave us. And changed us. Christ's obedience and righteousness. Is imputed to us. That's the legal aspect of justification. We're declared righteous before a holy God. But there's more to it than that. The fruit of, uh, of the, the cross is the Holy Spirit's work of regeneration. Where he creates in us a new man. Amen. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Something that never existed before in us. So think about this. What does he do when he saves us? The Holy Ghost, the, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. In regeneration, God gives us his love and gives us the capability of loving him and loving his law. You ever think about this? Paul the Apostle did not say that the law, he never said that the law was evil. The talk of a regenerate man is, for I delight in the law of God out of the inward man. Mm -hmm. He agreed with the psalmist. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Listen, when you're saving, He puts His, sheds His love abroad in your heart. You ought to love what He loves. Amen. Then He says, what happens when our soul is saved? For all eternity. Amen. Through the work of Christ, our mind is changed and enlightened. And for the first time, we are given a desire to love and cherish and embrace and pursue the things of God. I remember I hadn't been saved for more than a month. And I'm, I'm riding to church with somebody. We were having a watch night service or something like that. And I said, I, I don't understand it, man. I said, this... Six weeks ago, I had no desire for the things of God. And now, it's like my eyes are open. And I, I, I can't wait to hear the word. I, my, I, I want to be in the house Amen. of God. I love being around God's people. And what I was doing was just as an infant. Mm -hmm. 
was expressing the truth. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. And his strength, his vital force of life and grace is freely given unto us. And for the first time in our lives, according to Romans 6, we have real liberty. For the first time, we are now capable of loving the Lord and bringing forth fruits of righteousness. We were incapable of doing that when we served sin. Mm -hmm. But He liberated us. Amen. And now gives us the strength to love Him and to serve Him. This is the greatest thing that ever has ever happened in my life and that will ever happen. Amen. To truly know Christ. To be changed by the power of His death for me and His burial and His resurrection. There is nothing more glorious in all the world. This is not merely a doctrine or an intellectual teaching. This is something that's been shed abroad in my heart. Amen. Yeah. And it's changed me forever. Yeah. Oh, how I pray. If you're not saved here tonight, then God will show you the depths of your sin mm -hmm. and make you realize you don't have what it takes. Yeah. You're completely unrighteous. And give you the grace to say simply, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I claim. Amen. O Lamb of God, I come. I come repenting of my rebellion, of my wasted strength and serving sin and the devil and my rebellion. I repent of all of that because I hate it. I hate what it's doing to my life. And I embrace the love, the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. I know the truth for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right now you can have it the moment you repent and believe. 